in these several minutes, I would like to introduce you to um, this uh, lecture series, also to the GenLab, which is the organizer of this uh, lecture to, of today and the lecture series of the spring semester. And then to finally introduce our today's lecturer, Slobodan Kadekic. Uh, so let me just say a few words about about this uh, lecture series, which is uh, it was given a, a I don't know to what extent an inventive name, targeting anti-gender politics. Um, it's definitely not a too inventive name since uh, the, the process of targeting such politics is being in process for at least um, at the moment five to six years, uh, especially relevant and especially poignant in the central uh, European countries like Hungary and Poland and to some extent Slovakia as well. Uh, but also then in Germany, France. Uh, so in a sense, uh, this, this anti-gender politics has been recognized as a very important actor in today's conservative, illiberal, neoliberal um, political landscape. Uh, but what we wanted to do at the Institute for Philosophy and, and Social Theory, and especially in our gender uh, lab uh, called GenLab, the Gender Research Laboratory, uh, was to, to try to focus a little bit uh, this process of targeting and to, to uh, draw our attention to the southeast of Europe and the Caucasus. Uh, it seemed to us that in these regions, um, there, are at there are to some extent uh, less um, researches being done or that these uh, researches are not as well known so uh, we wanted to um, get into a kind of conversation with the countries which have already established themselves as very important and the researchers of course who established themselves as very important in this field uh, so that was our first uh, motivation for this um, lecture series um, then the second one uh, since the uh, institute uh, of philosophy and social theory is in belgrade serbia um, we at this moment have a very important set of laws uh, which are going to be passed or we will see whether they will going to be passed on gender equality and anti-discrimination law and for the first time there is some serious uh, signs that the, the, the law on the same-sex partnership is also going to be introduced so this is for us I would say I would dare to say in the next few months going to be a very hot topic and how anti-gender discourse is going to arise is going to be very important to follow. Uh, so in that sense, some kind of comparative uh, experiences would be of, of very great importance for, for us here. Um, and I would want to say that this, this uh, lecture series has been conceived as, uh, in the spring semester as a, as a series of four lectures where we, were, we'll, we will host, uh, apart from Boba Dekic, also uh, the researchers from Croatia, from Bulgaria and from Armenia. But the idea is to basically continue with uh, this lecture series and to have it uh, again uh, with us in, in, the, in the autumn semester, in the, in the winter semester, so that this is a, a, a kind of an ongoing conversation. Um, so having said that, um, I would just briefly introduce uh, Slobodanka Bovadekic, whom I personally know for many years. And as we uh, were talking previous to my uh, switching into English, um, I, I knew her for a very long time as an activist, and especially um, a very important activist in LGBTQ plus um, politics and how how to, to obtain a kind of a, a peaceful and possible life for LGBTQ plus people. Um, uh, Slobodan Kadekic used to live for a long time in Sarajevo and as she wrote herself, she obtained her professional experience in media centers, me media center, media center Sarajevo and LGBT organizations in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Right now, she's a PhD candidate in sociology at the final year at the Faculty of Philosophy at the University of Belgrade. And at the same time, she's a researcher within the project called Fatigue, 
delayed transformational fatigue in Central and Eastern Europe, responding to the rise of illiberalism slash populism. And today she will uh, talk on a topic which is um, intranslatable in, into uh, the languages that we normally speak, yes. politics, politics or policies, confronting anti-gender narratives on family and gender by LGBT organizations in Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Croatia. Now, Bobo, the floor is yours. If you would need any kind of technical help, please, uh, please let me know. Thank you, thank you, Adriana. Uh, so basically you, basically, you already said everything I wanted to say, or say about myself, uh, so I won't be repeating. Um, as Adriana already mentioned, I don't have background in the academy. Actually, I uh, worked for a long time, both professionally and voluntarily, in several NGOs, mainly in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So it's uh, no surprise, actually, that... Uh, that my topic is related to uh, to LGBT rights. Um, so uh, I will start just sharing the screen. Uh, so basically, uh, what uh, I am interested in and uh, the topic of my thesis and of my research uh, is related to legalization of same-sex partnerships, uh, same-sex families. Uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia and Serbia. And what I'm actually looking is into uh, the various lobbying and advocacy initiatives and activities of local LGBT organizations regarding this issue and how they are actually negotiating it and whether this issue is being negotiated with uh, anti-gender discourses and movements in these countries. So what I'm interested in is not so much the anti-gender discourse on same-sex families, but how local LGBT organizations, um, which I'm seeing as progressive forces, so to say, um, are actually framing this counter alternative narrative on, on family through this idea of same-sex families. So before I get to this central point of my research, I would just like to go through uh, some um, basic uh, key points that we already uh, know, so to say, about anti-gender movements and anti-gender politics. Um, so basically, when we're talking about anti-gender ideology, I think it's useful to make a distinction between movements and discourses, having in mind that these two are not necessarily developed in the same time as, for example, in Serbia. We can definitely talk uh, about discourses that are being present in the public space, uh, but there is no movement developed as in Croatia, for example, and I will uh, get back to this issue also later. So what we can know is that uh, these organizations appeared around 2010 in Europe and according to Neil Data, most of them actually emerged from the Brazilian organization Tradition, Family and Property that was founded in the 60s. And after its dissolution in Brazil, the movement moved to Europe. Uh, so what we are witnessing, I think, is kind of development of anti-gender civil society scene um, because um, it's um, like the network of organizations um, that are uh, legally registered. They are working using kind of democratic means in order to achieve their goals. Uh, referring to referendums, public protests, uh, being really active on grassroots uh, level. And what I think is very important, they are also excluding violence in, in their activities. So in that regard, I really don't see anything in their organizational management that is radically different from the way the progressive, so to say, civil society is operating. Um, now, in terms of discourses, um, what seems to be key prerogative is this protection of traditional family. And I also find it very interesting, and it's mentioned in a text on uh, Croatian anti-gender movements that was published in uh, Kuhar and Paternot edited uh, book by Hodzic and Stulhofer, is that these movements actually uh, present family as kind of 
of a modern family with husband and wife who are always white, presumably Christian, uh, usually presented as urban professionals with two smiling kids. So we are not talking about this kind of a medieval household traditional family type. So this family is uh, protected from, first of all, gender theory, which is seen as false and totalitarian ideology imposed either from the corrupt elites or from the Brussels. It kind of depends on the context in which anti-gender discourse is settled. Uh, it has to be protected from feminism, homosexualism, uh, which are also seen as imposed ideologies that insist on rights, including sexual and reproductive rights, and equality, including legalization of same-sex marriages. So in that regard, we could define anti-gender as counter-movement challenging achievements of human rights movements. And finally, families are being protected from the effects of profound crisis, both on political, economical, social level, which is caused by neoliberalism uh, and not being adequately addressed by the political and cultural establishment in European societies. Nevertheless, what I would like to do now is to take kind of a different approach, a little turn in analyzing anti-gender ideology and so to say, put aside things that we already know and go back to the original anti-gender manifesto, which is one of them could be this document, it's restoring the natural order. It was published by Anti-Gender Initiative Agenda for Europe in 2014. And I'm sure that most of you already know uh, what I'm talking about, but <clears throat> I found this document actually very important, very interesting, because not only it gives clear insight into the logic of anti-gender argumentation, but I think it also provides ground for critical evaluation of progressive thought and action on certain issues. And I think that it's still lacking in, in this discussion. So basically the problems that humankind is faced today emerged as consequence of sexual revolution in the 60s. So it's kind of classical <clears throat> neoconservative idea. Uh, but <clears throat> what is the problem is that sex, sex is separated from reproduction. We have complete destruction of traditional family values, the idea of marriage. Uh, we have domination of human rights, various political ideologies. Um, that are conflicting this natural order, natural law that is seen as source of morality. And uh, the document singles out several false ideologies that present the main threat to the survival of family, but also to the humankind. So we have Marxism, which insists on antagonism between classes. We have feminism that insists on antagonism between men and women. Um, and both of them are problematic because they uh, insist on destroying the family as private space. So they insist on relying strongly on the state, especially welfare state in supporting the family. So the problem with feminism is not gender per se, but it's insistence on economic equality between men and women. And hence women are supported to go out and work. Uh, social protection is needed, social welfare mechanisms are needed in order to uh, support the family. Uh, homosexuality is also one of these false ideologies. Uh, and it has dual nature in, in this document. So on one hand, it is treated as kind of a natural instinct and attraction that one can feel toward a um, uh, person of the same sex. But when this instinct actually becomes a practice, that becomes a problem. So the same logic actually goes for heterosexual intercourse. So any kind of sexual practice that is outside the marriage and without reproduction as its final aim is against natural law. But the real problem with homosexuality is that it appears as ideology. It insists on politics uh, and on conflict between heterosexual majority and homosexual minority, as well as on the idea that homosexuality is natural and therefore normal and it cannot be sanctioned. So it should be granted with equal rights, even with the right to marry and to have a family. So it's not understood only as a threat to traditional family, but also as a threat to kind of a normal understanding of sexuality. 
transgender issue is also mentioned in this document. Now, not in the form, in the context of ideology. Uh, so what they're saying is that we're talking about a minority uh, which is born in the wrong body and per se it's not a problem. But what is a problem is their demand uh, for respect of the right to self-identification, which actually implies negation of a natural, basic, uh, true, uh, that there are only two sexes, male and female. And in this sense, transgender is actually part of a larger false ideology, and that is relativism, which brings into question everything that is normal, natural, and, uh, and understandable. Uh, and finally, the biggest threat is actually gender theory. So uh, it claims freedom of choice and fluidity of sex and gender identities. It reduces them to personal experience and it reflects radical liberalism, not feminism, uh, that insists on the individual understanding of reality and negates any possibility of objectivity. So the consequences of this ideology for the family are enormous because it not only supports legalization of same-sex families, but it actually brings into question the very foundation of the family life, existence of men and women as two different but complementary pillars of, of family. But there are, I think, several important issues um, that I would like to stick on, uh, not so much for understanding the anti-gender logic, but issues that are important for progressive counter-narrative that uh, are being raised by this document. And just for the sake of time, I will focus on three of them, basically. So the first one is this difference that is made between feminism, homosexual ideology, and gender theory on one side. So it's based in the presumption that feminism and homosexualism at least recognize the existence of two biological sexes and homosexual instincts, so something that person is born with. They do not deny biology, unlike gender theory that brings nature and biology into question. Now, we could, of course, relate this to ignorance, to the lack of knowledge about diversity of feminist theories and especially postmodern feminism, relation to queer theory, etc. But I think this issue actually opens up a kind of a Pandora box inside the progressive camp. So first of all, um, and I would argue this based on my professional experience, um, there is little knowledge or even interest of mainstream feminist that is women and LGBT organization, uh, you know, organizations to include uh, this perspective in their work that would actually go beyond this common idea that sex is biological category and gender is a social one. So the same is stated in UN documents, the same is stated in, in Istanbul Convention. And this crack in the progressive discourse is I think most visible when it is faced with transphobia coming from the anti-gender camp. And it's actually articulated as fight against gender ideology. So that actually happened in Croatia in 2018. And uh, then uh, local anti-gender organizations were extremely successful in mobilizing citizens to protest against ratification of Istanbul Convention. So they claimed that it will impose um, uh, gender ideology agenda in Croatia, that uh, they will be faced with 30 or more genders uh, in Croatia, lessons for boys and girls, uh, that they can choose whether they would like to be boys or girls or something else, etc., etc. Now, the answer from the progressive camp, which was comprised mainly from local uh, mainstream women NGOs, um, was kind of pathetic because they claimed that there is no gender ideology in the Istanbul Convention, that it is only about preventing violence against women, domestic violence. So basically the whole transphobic campaign, uh, which actually had some serious impact on everyday life of trans persons in Croatia and their families, and insistence on binary heteronormative understanding of gender and sex remained completely untouched. And finally, convention in Croatia was ratified, but with this interpretative statement uh, claiming that um, 
it will mitigate anxieties and tensions over so-called gender ideology agenda that is being introduced uh, in, the, in the convention. Uh, so this kind of biggest understanding of gender inside the progressive camp, I think deserves much more analysis than uh, we have, than it's uh, the, the, uh, currently the state. So I would like in that regard to refer to the work of Esther Kovac actually, and I uh, think she's one of the rare authors that actually insists on this issue uh, when um, analyzing anti-gender and progressive narratives and their conflicts. So. I think she's actually right when she claims that the main problem for anti-gender discourses is not gender per se, but very specific postmodern queer interpretation of gender, which brings into question the biological natural understanding of sex and gender, as a Gender for Europe document actually shows. So on the other hand, women and LGBT organizations seem to cannot find an effective answer to these accusations because they are too focused on the politics of identity or politics of recognition as defined by Nancy Fraser and um, Kovac also refers to her, um, instead of politics of distribution that would actually define gender as basic principle that determines the difference between paid and unpaid or low paid labor and as such, will become powerful enough to challenge the problem of economic and social inequalities that actually push people toward the right wing and anti-gender politics as solutions. Um, the second important issue that is being raised by the agenda document, and I think also the men's thinking, uh, is uh, the issue of the family. Uh, so for the neoconservative um, and modern anti-gender narratives, a strong economically and socially sustainable independent family based on marriage between men and women presents foundation of stable and healthy society. So my question is, what is the alternative of this vision proposed by the progressive narratives? And in looking uh, in, in the literature and thinking about this, uh, this alternative, um, I actually run into a great book by Paul Ginsburg on family politics. Uh, and among other countries, he's also analyzing post-revolutionary Russia. Uh, and there is a family code that was brought in 1918. Uh, and it's article 160 says that children have no right to the property of their parents or parents to the property of their children. Now, even in post-revolutionary Russia, this um, article didn't live too long. But I think it's interesting to have in, in mind what kind of families we are actually capable of, of talking about. Um, instead of that, what I think we are seeing now, we are seeing a modern family of 21st century, which actually presents kind of a cornerstone of neoliberal and neoconservative dogma. And um, it actually goes far away from this Russian model. And instead of insisting on this alternative, the progressive narrative is offering us something quite different. Uh, and um, the key question for me is, what is actually the relation between neoliberal politics and this neoconservative family model that is pushed by anti-gender movements? So certain authors like Graf and Korovchuk claim that they are conflicting in terms that anti-gender movements actually use the idea of traditional family as defense from neoliberal insistence on individuality and modernity. But there are other authors like Melinda Cooper or Dorota Sezeleva that insist that actually the neoconservative and neoliberal ideas on the family are complementary. So Sezeleva claims that rise of anti-gender politics in Eastern and Central Europe should be observed in the context of political and economic transformation of these societies after 1989, when strong family had to be reaffirmed in order to replace social welfare that was radically transformed during the transition. And similar process is followed in the United States by Melinda Cooper, who claims that conservative praise for reviving these traditional family values in the 80s in the United States was actually parallel with the tendencies of neoliberalism to enforce 
family uh, inheritance is key factor in distribution of wealth and class formation. Uh, and it's also um, kind of an argument for, for Piketty. So this reinvasion of family uh, was based in affirmation of traditional family values, especially family responsibility, uh, defining it as self-sustainable, economically reliable, much like the neoliberal individual uh, in order to achieve success in the free market and pass the inheritance to its offspring. For this to happen, family had to be strictly separated from the state, especially from the social welfare mechanisms and to be transformed in the line with conservative values. What I think is also important to mention is that social welfare in this process was not destroyed completely, just like, like in the Central European, Eastern European countries uh, after the transition, but it was transformed into the welfare system that is actually in the line with conservative values. And it's strictly focused on families, so providing assistance to the particular type of families. Um, and such were the family strategies, the family programs that were presented, for example, in Poland or Hungary a couple of years ago. So we could claim that anti-gender model of ideal family doesn't challenge the neoliberal system, but it actually sustains it by insisting on relying uh, on family that is relying on itself, protecting itself from the state, functioning as a private space, being strong, being self-sustainable. So <clears throat> now the key point of my research is the question whether same-sex families could actually be seen as kind of an alternative to this. But um, what I'm actually claiming is that that is not the case. So that same-sex families and uh, idea of their legalization actually confirms this strong bond between neoliberalism and neoconservatism, uh, and they actually quit, uh, fit quite well into this neoconservative vision of the family. Um, <clears throat> there are already uh, discussed um, several uh, very um, uh, problematic aspects, so to say, of the same-sex marriage and same-sex uh, uh, families uh, by various authors. And uh, I would just like now to go through some of these points uh, in order to critically rethink the legalization of same-sex partnerships as alternative to the traditional family. So the first one is this persistence on the idea that legalization is important for achieving social and economic rights for um, lesbian and gay persons. Uh, I had to uh, underline that because transgender people were excluded and continue to be excluded from these, uh, these discussions. Uh, and it's based on the idea that marriage actually is the only acceptable foundation of family. And this all has roots at the very beginning of fight for the recognition of same-sex families, uh, which actually started in the 60s and was focused on lesbian mothers and their fight for custody rights, uh, which were complicated to gain because back then uh, homosexuality was still on the list of um, mental disorders. And uh, basically as such, uh, it was this issue was recognized as priority pr primarily in the lesbian movement and not so much among gays. But what is important is that at the very beginning, this idea of the family was much broader than the one implying uh, legitimized uh, private nuclear family model, um, they were actually fighting for the rights of different families, not only based on marriage, with or without children. So all the variants that existed outside this dominant normative of nuclear family model. And in that regard, I think it's also important to refer to the seminal essay of John D'Amelio, uh, on the uh, importance of capitalism in creation uh, of uh, gay and lesbian identity and politics. And basically he claims that uh, the possibility of escaping nuclear family uh, was uh, the, the um, uh, biggest um, opportunity uh, for gay and lesbian, gays and lesbians uh, and uh, provided them actually space to create the identity, to create the culture and to create the politics, the movement. Uh, and in that regard, um, we should kind of insist 
not on reaffirming, on, on going back to this nuclear, nuclear family model, but we should fight for widely understood communities, which might provide personal auto autonomy and in the same time sense of belonging and emotional connections. But uh, the whole movement actually took a different approach to this issue in the 80s and especially in the 90s. And legalization of same-sex marriages became imperative for gay and lesbian organizations in the United States. Um, and this uh, idea was um, uh, articulated to these uh, economic advantages of marriage, uh, of uh, regulation of inheritance rights, health insurance. Uh, so. Um, this whole approach was now focused only on gay and lesbian partnerships, excluding all others, even those gay and lesbian couples who work in low paid economies or the ones who are basically not in stable relationships. So for Lisa Dugan actually, this was simply lost of transformative and revolutionary potential of lesbian and gay movement. And it presents a reflection of politics of homonormativity, which basically are not trying to transform these dominant heteronormative institutions in politics, such as marriage or family, but they adopt them and sustain them. In the same time, they are the politicizing gay and lesbian activism and enforce policies instead of politics. I also think that uh, in that regard, it is important to mention an interesting work of, of Ulrike Dahl um, on the imperative of happiness that is brought upon same-sex families and same-sex partnerships, coming from the presumption that now we have something that was not even imaginable a few decades ago, and failure is not an option. So if you look closely, all stories about same-sex families are kind, are kind of stories of success. There are no divorces, there, there's no unhappiness, there are no uh, ugly custody fights uh, over custody rights, etc., etc. And in the same time, there is this also imperative of having kids, of including children into this idea of family so it can be complete. Um, and setting very high standards for same-sex parenthood that urges to provide the best possible uh, open democratic education and nurture, nurture for the children, which is an, actually an effort that demands significant financial resources. Uh, and that's also one aspect that is not so far being tackled so much, and that's the class aspect of the whole same-sex family story. So the simple question, who can afford them? Uh, another problematic thing uh, for legalized same-sex partnerships is related to this essentialization of homosexuality. So basically, um, the argument goes that homosexuality is natural, something that we are born with, as the agenda document is saying, and then it should be granted the same rights as heterosexuality. Now, this logic is actually quite similar to the anti-gender position that only heterosexual men and women are naturally predestined to be responsible partners because both arguments are grounded in the idea of nature. And finally, um, one critical aspect of, um, of the whole same-sex families uh, issue is related to this right-wing dimension, so to say, um, that is emerging in modern politics of radical right in Europe and the United States, where defense of the rights of sexual minorities, of LGBT people, including their right to marriage, uh, is actually taken as kind of a demarcation line between us, the Europeans who are modern, um, progressive, uh, who are open, democratic, versus them, uh, who are the other, who are mainly immigrant Muslim countries, um, who are backwarded um, and um, aiming to deprive uh, LGBT uh, population of their, of their rights. So suddenly right wing, radical right becomes a protector of uh, LGBT rights. And this is can be partially connected with um, the concept of homonationalism that is defined by Jasbir Puar in her book in 2017, 
as kind of a process of normalization and nationalization, so to say, of gay and lesbian identities, which are now becoming part of us because they are accepting and promoting values of patriotism, of uh, Western modernity, progressiveness in contrast to the rest of underdeveloped and backwarded world. Um, so uh, there is also an interesting work um, of uh, Marine Klappe, uh, which um, defines concept of homo develop developmentalism um, as um, kind of modern modernity being measured with the level of acceptance of LGBT rights, uh, beginning with the criminalization of homosexuality to the legalization of same-sex partnerships. So in order to become closer to the modernity developing country, in need of financial aid should adopt and implement various policies and measures whose aim is to and secure respect for human rights, but which in the same time leave aside more problematic issues of social and economic inequalities and rights. So basically in this way, even the problem of violence against LGBT person, persons is treated through adoption of anti-discrimination law. And uh, I can really argue that anyone who has ever worked on this problem knows how irrelevant actually and powerless these legislations are and policies are when you, when you are faced with, with violence on, on, the, on the ground. Um, now, I also argue um, that uh, Legalization of same-sex partnerships cannot provide real alternative to the traditional family model as envisioned by anti-gender movements uh, because this idea only replicates neoliberal family values which are the basis of so-called traditional family. Uh, and now I would like to turn to um, the cases of Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina and kind of um, share with you uh, this um, the the stage of my research that I'm currently uh, currently in. So um, in Croatia, the law was uh, adopted in uh, 2014 uh, after fierce opponents from uh, local anti-gender organizations, which actually succeeded in um, organizing referendum, whose result was the adoption of the provision in the Croatian constitution, that marriage is a union between men and a woman. And that happened in 2013. So the key for succeeding to push the adoption of this law uh, for local LGBT organization was uh, political support that was gained from the government uh, at that time led by Social Democratic Party. But what also contributed to this success was the shortcoming of anti-gender campaign itself which actually insisted on promoting the dominant model of normal family based on marriage between men and women and children. And it actually was conflicted with the various family models that people are living in from extramarital cohabitations to single parent households. And basically this insistence on normal family quite pissed off the general public in Croatia and kind of um, gave um, sort of a positive push for local LGBT initiative. Uh, in Serbia, uh, we actually have interesting situation going on at the moment. So <clears throat> apparently the law will be adopted this spring. Um, and uh, the whole idea was initiated around 2010 by a lesbian organization, Labris. Um, and uh, basically the whole process of advocating for it was uh, one step forward, two steps behind. It was always a question that was marginalized comparing to some bigger political issues uh, and manipulated in that regard. Uh, so um, apparently this government will make this, this uh, step, but it seems that the draft of the law that is now in the procedure uh, includes only social and economic rights, inheritance rights, but nothing related to children. So there is no mentioning of secondary adoption, uh, like uh, creation law uh, has that option. Um, and that is um, an urgent need for many lesbian and gay families on the ground. 
Um, but what is interesting for school is not being discussed in the public. So everything is kind of going on under the table. Uh, there are no public discussions, referendums, protests. Um, and even the new patriarch of Serbian Orthodox Church had quite affirmative message uh, concerning this issue. And um, I don't know if uh, we are not going to, uh, we're going to miss actually uh, this attack from anti-gender circles in Serbia, uh, or they will uh, became active in a couple of months. We will see that. But what I think is important also to mention is that unlike Croatia that has um, professionally organized uh, uh, we have, uh, I call them circle of friends, um, individuals basically who are um, promoting anti-gender discourses, uh, who are related to this conservative academic cultural establishment, but there is no organization per se and they lack, actually lack uh, serious support from any Um, prominent political, at least for me at the moment, extremely complicated case. Um, so uh, just to give you a brief introduction, it's, uh, it's not a centralized country. It's uh, actually consisted from two entities and my research is focused on Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, predominantly Bosnian population and significant influence of Islamic religious community. Uh, but uh, what is, I think, important is that <clears throat> the whole issue on legalization of same-sex partnerships was initiated, um, I think, two years ago, uh, and the working group has been formed uh, by representatives of institutions uh, that will actually discuss the possible draft of the legislation. Um, so for the, uh, there are no campaigns initiated by local uh, LGBT organizations, Sarajevo Open Center, and uh, they frame actually this issue uh, as primary social and economic one. So emphasizing benefits for same-sex couples in terms of social and health insurance, inheritance, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now, right-wing and anti-gender discourses and movements in this part of Bosnia and Herzegovina are very hard to be identified for me. So there are, of course, traditional views on family and gender relations among all ma major political parties, religious communities, but none of them actually has this specific anti-gender elements. So this idea of tradition is grounded in national and religious identity, and it doesn't flirt, so to say, with scientific explanations. It doesn't include gender theory or some conspiracy elements. So I think one example is very indicative, actually, in that regard. Um, when media in Bosnia and Herzegovina announced formation of this working group for legis legislation on same-sex partnerships, it was immediately interpreted as federation will allow gay marriage. And one prominent member of extremely nationalistic and exclusionist Bosnian parties in Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, announced that he will support gay marriage if the state allows legislation of Sharia marriages. That is polygamic families <clears throat> that are, of course, part of family reality in, in this part of Bosnia. Now, this example was quite indicative for me uh, because it actually pointed to the opportunity for LGBT organizations to frame this issue in um, kind of genuinely inclusive way, forming alliances beyond imaginable, include uh, different variants of families in discussion on same-sex families, but um, it never actually happened and I doubt it will happen. Um, so what can be seen as kind of a common feature, uh, features of, of these campaigns um, is that so far there is a tendency of local organizations to frame issue of same-sex partnerships as exclusively LGBT rights issue based in the argument of normality. So 
uh, that's what we are hearing in Serbia in the past few weeks, and it drives me crazy, that we are capable of having normal and stable relationships, whatever that means, um, and that it is discriminatory that we are deprived of benefits and advantages that already exist for heterosexual couples. Now, these benefits uh, are also related to the access of social protection, health insurance, inheritance rights, implying that LGBT family politics agreed that these should be granted in marriage and not available to all, regardless of their marriage or family status. So I think this actually points out uh, to how um, this idea of same-sex, legalized same-sex partnerships supports the neoconservative vision of the family, a stable, self-sufficient entity that is capable to take care of its members and secure them social and class mobility through inheritance. So the second problem that is kind of specific for this area, maybe, is that none of these campaigns, none of these uh, policies um, actually confronts the dominant pro-natal discourses in family in these respective countries. So basically, none of the organization dealing with this issue challenges the state the narrative on family as key for reproduction of the nation. So it's framed exclusively through human rights paradigm. Uh, and I see this perhaps as the key deficiency of local LGBT organizations in their capacity to challenge the local anti-gender narratives who heavily rely on dominant national narratives of victimhood in their vision of traditional family. Now, why is this happening? And this is kind of my conclusion. Um, I simply do not see local women and LGBT organizations to have capacity to confront anti-gender discourses and organization organizations, not because um, they lack uh, resources, but because they lack politics and they lack ideology. Uh, and I think this is the result uh, of the, we have to go back to the very beginning of development of civil society sector as we know it today, uh, uh, at the beginning of the 90s, and uh, a thought of um, Darko Suvin, Yugoslav author, um, was very important for me in that regard. He stated that the very term civil society emerged in Yugoslavia at the end of 80s as part of the bourgeois democracy propaganda, whose aim was to emphasize lack of freedom in officially communist countries. So basically the whole idea of civil society in post Yugoslavia, as well as I think in Eastern and Central Europe, uh, emerged as securing a key actor in fighting communism. Uh, with the basis in human rights ideology uh, and under a huge influence of, um, of neoconservative um, politics, primary in the American administration during the 80s and the 90s. Uh, so basically, we have civil society that is focused on free elections, media freedom, rule of law, respect for human rights, uh, but its vision was always related to the creation of neoliberal society in which kind of democracy and peace are strictly bound to the neoliberal free market. Another problem is this whole process of angelization of civil society sector. And that is also a topic that is quite well analyzed, at least in, in our context. Uh, and um, it indicates several things. First of all, professionalization of local NGOs um, in terms of structure, focusing more on working with institutions instead of grassroots level, which we see uh, as, as one of the key uh, um, roots of power of, of anti-gender movements, their ability actually to go on this grassroots level. Uh, most of the NGOs were actually focused on contributing EU integration process and it was rarely, if ever, critically examined. Um, also, there is dependence on donors' agendas, finances, uh, which has significant influence on the activities of, of organizations. Um, and finally, I think that the overall focus of civil society 
on human rights and institutional change actually indicates very important aspect of its neoconservative and neoliberal nature, and that is its neutrality from the wider political and social context and intention to operate only on the policy level. And that's also, according to Lisa Dugan, um, implies this technocratic vision of state and civil society, which is crucial to neoliberal politics, so insists on a third way. It insists on non-politics, um, on being reasonable, being practical, uh, being a good manager, but without any, uh, any politics, any ideas, any values, any ideal ideology. And I think that's uh, actually the, the biggest uh, crack in the whole progressive narrative and progressive movement when confronting with anti-gender movements, anti-gender politics. So that's um, all from me. Thank you, Bobo. This was really inspiring, I have to say, and a very uh, powerful uh, critique of, um, well, the politics, if there is one in the region. Um, there is already a question, which I have seen. I will now, in fact, want to uh, invite you to, in, I do, to use all the possible ways that we have, either write your question or just uh, appear uh, on the screen or, or, I don't know, raise hands so we can use various, various Zoom opportunities we have. Um, I would not like to use my time. I would rather like you to, uh, if you want to read this question that came from Lana Bovic and maybe, maybe immediately start a discussion. Um, and then I could also jump in later on if needed. So Lana Bovic wrote, do you see the question in the, in the, in the chat? Uh, there was a question in the chat. Okay, do you find the existence of professionally organized anti-gender movements? Uh, connected with the faith mm -hmm. is it a Catholic country and much more under the influence of religious fundamentalism. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking actually about that. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, anti-gender movements appearing uh, in countries which are not dominantly uh, Catholic or, or um, uh, Christian, but um, I think that uh, the problem with Serbia uh, is, um, yeah, could be uh, the fact that um, the influence of, uh, of, of uh, Catholic Church is not so big. Um, but then again, the influence of Russia is quite big, but it doesn't result in organized movement. Uh, what is even more interesting for me is how is it that uh, there is nothing in, uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now, again, I have to emphasize I'm focusing on the Bosniak part, so to say, the, the Muslim part of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So it may be uh, that maybe even more confirms um, this, uh, this possible explanation that existence and strong presence of Catholic Church could be the one of the most powerful actually generator of, of anti-gender politics in the certain context. Well, if there is no question of immediate importance, I would like, I, I'm, I'm, I have many ideas, of course, many questions as well. Uh, first, I wanted to ask you what you think about, I was thinking about one phrase which uh, was very relevant for me from Andrea Petto, Andrea Petto's work, where she uh, said that uh, a social contract of the 1990s has been broken, where the human rights have been completely uh, put in the background. And this is what she uh, very often uh, links to illiberalism, uh, which is a very hot topic in the countries of the Central Europe. So first, I mean, somehow illiberalism was not part of your speech. And I would like to, to hear how you see that, especially because you are working within the project that is relating itself to populism and illiberalism. But what is interesting to me is that you rather uh, put a focus of your research 
or of your critique, which I find really, really important, and um, I would like many activists to hear it, um, is, is to what extent am I right when I, when I um, see or perceive that you are putting a, a, a greater stress on the fact that the three countries which are under your uh, concern, or in your concern, uh, that they are post-socialist countries mm -hmm. um, rather than on the different religious uh, backgrounds that are important for them. Uh, so how much, I mean, what do you see uh, there as a post-socialism as a background? So illiberalism on the one hand and post-socialism on the other. Well, I'm, I'm kind of developing this uh, relation to, to the whole illiberalism, right-wing populism moment. Uh, but I would firstly like to stress that uh, I, I actually don't think that the whole anti-gender politics is necessarily uh, related only to right-wing uh, um, politics, to right-wing agenda. Uh, because, uh, I mean, of course, we could ask a question, uh, what is the left, political left today, and whether political left has um, this kind of open understanding of gender and gender policy politics. Uh, and it's very questionable for me. And I think that we also have to take into account uh, that uh, most of very um, restrictive social measures, uh, measures that actually uh, reduced uh, social welfare in post-socialist countries, including post-Yugoslavia, that were happening from the beginning of the 90s onward, uh, actually went along with kind of a, of a silence uh, from the civil society. So basically um, the whole social and economic uh, issue, issue of inequalities, of insecurities remains untouched or very briefly touched, so to say. And the focus was on strengthening of, of human rights. Now, the whole idea of human rights, uh, I think, also has to be criticized. And I think that uh, Moyn has a very good um, uh, critical point in that regard. Esther Kovac also writes about human rights and how this paradigm actually is not enough. It's not sufficient to challenge uh, these, these issues that anti-gender and right-wing movements are actually talking about. So I see connection between uh, anti-gender politics and right, radical right, uh, primary in their insistence uh, on this, um, uh, Jovo Bakic um, uh, writes about that, this um, chauvinistic social policy. Uh, so it's kind of a, of a very reduced vision of social policy that is, uh, that is um, focused on certain categories, on certain issues that actually fit into this conservative narrative. So in our countries, that would mean, for example, protection of families, but very strictly defined type of families and strictly defined areas of family life. Uh, and for example, uh, demobilized um, uh, soldiers, that's, that's case in Bosnia specifically and, and Croatia, um, but uh, not, for example, issues of poverty, issues of, of uh, you know, which go beyond this, this agenda. I also find the, the, this connection in their vision of, um, in that um, narrative on family I was talking about, and that's this pronatal uh, discourse on family, which here is really grounded is the, in this nationalistic narrative. So when Vucic, for example, says that um, we have to have more babies because the Albanians are doing it better and faster, uh, it remains kind of, you know, completely disregarded by the civil society sector. It remains without any comment from LGBT organizations. So my question is why? And I ask the same question, um, my, my friends, I have to say, and my colleagues from, from organizations, and they're like, but it's not our job. That's, that's not uh, in what we are dealing with. There are organizations like peace organizations um, who are dealing with these issues of confronting the past and things like that, but that's not us. So, 
I, I think that's, that's the key problem that we are actually missing we are missing the larger picture here. We are focusing on very specific issues um, that, that remain in kind of a ghetto of not even LGBT population in general, but very, very small percentage of, of gay and lesbian couples who would like to have some legal frame to make their relationship stable. And that's the problem. I don't know if I answered your question, but uh, yeah. I have many options, but I'm, I'm <laughs> going to stop here and, and ask you to, to join us with questions. Huh? Uh, well, I then I want to uh, uh give myself a floor again and ask you just one more thing about the second part of the of the lecture which was uh, critical of of the lack of politics uh now you said something about this but then i would like you to to maybe um uh, to maybe say something more about that uh Nadja, are you maybe preparing yourself for a question wonderful then i will just shortly finish the question that is if you could uh, at what point would you uh, refer us back in time? So is it that 1990s or the beginning of 2000s or 2010s when uh, the, this process of compartmentalization, fragmentation of the bigger picture as you just described it, when that might have been dealt with differently? So what moment was important? But before you answering my questions, I would like to also give Nadja the trip the floor. Hi. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, thank you for thank you for doing this research and for sharing it with us and the institute for organizing this this lecture series. I think the topic is unfortunately spot on. Um, for me, I mean, as I was listening, one of the questions is that, at least from from the way you are framing it, it seems as if. LGBTIQ organizations seem to be a monolith. They seem to have one response to this issue. And so I'm wondering methodologically if you are including some differences among various civil society organizations or various activists, because I, I like to think at least there is some variation, um, not just between Serbia, Bosnia, uh, Herzegovina and Croatia, but also among different organizations. I understand that when we analyze the actual laws or, or um, the, the proposed laws, they do present this picture of marriage and family in, in actually sadly traditional terms. But within actual discourses that organizations use maybe in, in their other work in education or in campaigns or in, uh, in as much as they involve themselves in cultural production, for me, maybe a more, another avenue of research would be to look at not just the way that legally or politically we, we define marriage, because there I, I do agree, it's not very imaginative politically, but maybe other policies such as education or culture might provide more diverse discourses and more imagination and maybe particular actors or particular organizations might be braver to present actual alternatives, not just a family where people are not straight, but actual different living arrangements that will break these barriers and provide more more interesting lives and definitely lives with with more dignity mm -hmm. so that was that was my intervention thanks i will have to disappoint you but um i will come <laughs> back uh, to your question so uh Adriana, what, what what you asked like when everything began uh i'm uh, it's interesting for me actually to look uh, specifically into uh, the LGBT movement, for example. I will take that as an example here in, in post Yugoslav region. So basically, um, during the 90s, uh, the whole movement was uh, in kind of a developing phase. Uh, 
you know, with different uh, initiatives, uh, not so formed organizations. And as we know, uh, the whole decriminalization process started relatively late, especially in Bosnia and Serbia. Um, so basically these initiatives were not organized in the way current LGBT organizations are organized. So they were kind of fluid connected with women movement, with anti-war movement, et cetera, et cetera. Now there, there, is, uh, there are, thing, I think, very interesting aspects of, of that period of time. Uh, whether these initiatives were, were really on the, uh, so to say, organizational level uh, involved in these anti-nationalistic, uh, anti-war uh, initiatives, or, or it was just a few members uh, who had their personal motives and, and uh, desires to be, uh, to be part of, of those. But the moment, I think, when uh, uh, the things took a wrong turn uh, was uh, in 2000, I believe, because then in Serbia, actually, uh, everything started to, op to, to function on much more, so to say, managerial level. Um, and I mean, I think Mladen Lazic also writes about that in his book and many other authors. So everything kind of became professionalized. Uh, and in the same time, with the change of regime, for example, in Serbia uh, and in Bosnia, with the, the, the ending of, of, um, of war, um, it, it uh, kind of made civil society uh, as um, sort of, um, I don't know how to translate that, privredna grana. Mm. Industry. Like production. It's an industry. industry. Exactly. It, it's an industry. Uh, and I, I even feel bad because I'm saying this because I'm part of that industry. But it's true. Uh, so basically, you have projects, you have donors, uh, you have topics that you have to be focused on. And there is no intersectionality, not only on this political ideological level. But in practical level, there is no intersectionality. And that was, I think, the moment when civil society became um, you, uh, also uh, lost you, this aspect of social equity. Can you please repeat? Because we lost you, I think. Can you hear me? No, yes, now yes. But can you please repeat the thoughts, the huh. last one? OK. So. What I'm, what I'm saying is that organizations uh, and, and their activities were framed strictly uh, uh, through human rights discourse uh, and left completely aside the whole uh, social and economic um, uh, inequalities as a problem aside. So um, basically they were referring to them more in a way like we are exchanging the state in this regard and you are our clients. So. Um, but the, the structural problems remained intact. Uh, and Nadja, how, uh, how organizations react? Yeah. Um, well, I talked with uh, well, more than 20 um, LGBT activists from different organizations. And I mean, there are differences in Croatia now. Um, the huge problem is uh, the fact that the law that was adopted is actually not being implemented in the right way. So uh, all other laws that had to be um, adjusted with uh, this law that legalized um, same-sex partnerships are not being uh, adjusted. So people are basically left on their own. So, you know, you have the law, but but uh, whether and how you're going to use it, it's up to you. So there is organization in Zagreb that deals with uh, uh, LGBT family issues, uh, uh, and they are working, but uh, my sense is that they're operat operating more in this supporting uh, the family's manner. So the families are their clients and they support them if they have certain problem, uh, if, the, if they need certain explanations regarding the law, et cetera, et cetera. But there is no comprehensive 
family politics. There is not, nothing that could say, okay, we as LGBT persons, we want this when we talk about family. We don't have that. In Serbia, um, majority actually of, of people I talked to said that they don't think that's a priority issue. Uh, that priority issue is violence, is uh, protection of LGBT people. And I agree with that. I mean, violence is present, that's, that's a fact. But, um, you know, Well, but we lost you again. Oh, when, uh, when you hear that it's an issue, okay. I'm here. Can you hear violence, me? Violence is a problem and then we lost you. Uh-huh, okay. Many problems, I cannot remember. But uh, yeah, I mean, the situation is not much different in, uh, in Serbia uh, and uh, also in Bosnia where basically the whole issue is being uh, uh, run by one organization that exists and that deals with, with LGBT issues and that's Sarajevo Open Center. And they are doing so many other things. This is just like one of many issues that they are working on. Uh, we have a question from Ina Merdjanova uh, who asks, would you say more about the role of, of the Serbian Orthodox Church in anti-gender debates? And we have a comment from Lana Bobic who says that Dugin of Italy actually work on a quite legalistic level, not just support for our LGBTQ plus families. So please tell us something. Okay. Um, so the role of Serbian Orthodox Church, um, I, I haven't seen that they are being active uh, uh, in, in that regard, uh, but uh, there are certain um, associations of parents uh, who are close to Serbian Orthodox Church. Now, I'm not sure whether they are being, they are the ones who actually have this anti-gender narrative. So I wouldn't say that Serbian Orthodox Church itself is um, kind of a visible, uh, player in, in that field, but they have the satellites, either uh, the authors who are close to them, uh, either these uh, parents associations uh, uh, who, who are also having this strong anti-gender anti -gender narrative. Uh, now about Dugine of Italy, yes, they do. They work on legalistic level and um, there is also, of course, the case of, of uh, adoption, denied adoption by this, this gay couple. Now, I'm concluding this based on the uh, discussion interview I, ha I had with the uh, uh, with the representative of that organization. So my impression was that uh, Dugine Obitelli um, are operating on, on this organizational civil society model. So uh, it's not like they are, they are offering some kind of a different vision of family in, in Croatian society. Uh, but they are simply focused on LGBT parents, LGBTIQ families, uh, and that's their area of, of work. Of course, that was my impression from the interview. Well, if, if there are no more questions, I would, I would also want to say uh, that I think that what we really need at this moment is some kind of comparative study or comparative research on what is going on in Orthodox, uh, in countries where the Orthodox church is the dominant church, uh, because it's really interesting to see what happened in Bulgaria and how Bulgarian Orthodox church had a very prominent uh, role in, in the public debate and this social larger picture when it comes to anti-gender. Um, whereas here, at least, it's very silent, and so it would be interesting to really make some kind of comparison, uh, because such comparisons exist in the in the majority majority uh, Catholic or Protestant uh, religions. 
So uh, I think that this uh, this question of Ina Margenova is really important also for us here. Uh, uh, if if that's if the, that is the end of our debate, I want to thank you, Boba, uh, not just for a very enticing lecture, but also for the being the first in this lecture series uh, and opening up. Um, uh, an issue which is uh, not only comparative, which I think is really the most important for us here, but also um, kind of very critical from the inside and also thought provoking on many levels. So um, I want to thank you again, Vala, <laughs> yeah. and and thank you all for for being with us and for insp inspiring questions too. <laughs>